In today's episode, I speak to socialised maverick Alex Stables about how you can lead a multi-site operation with over a thousand employees. We discuss the differences between running a single site and a multi-one, the things that you must do to make it a success. Alex remarks that many of the places that he has worked, approximately 80% of his budget has been his people. He reminds the listeners that it makes perfect sense to care about them and invest in the people. We discuss the need for real leaders that can sell the company vision to their employees and take people with them. We also need people who are not afraid to think outside the box and challenge ideas. Improvement comes from that challenge. Listen up to the whole of the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the pathologically curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a Maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today our guest is Alex Stables. Hi, Alex. Hi, Jules. How are you doing? I'm doing well. You? I'm very well, thank you. I'm enjoying this lovely weather in the middle of lockdown at the moment. It's great fun. <laughs> I know it is. It is really bright at the moment. Um, before we begin, tell listeners about you. Well, me, there's not, not, not a great deal to tell. I mean, I've been I've been working in the logistics distribution distribution industry now for over thirty years. I've had a what I would consider to be a successful career. I'm used to managing large, complex, fast-paced distribution centres um, and also multi-site operations across various types of industries. Um, work, I've worked with large workforces, up to 1,000 people, um, but I've got and also have extensive experience dealing with unions. Mm. Um, used to deal with full P&L accountability and a vast experience in budget setting and profit achievements. Um, some of my major achievements in life, um, in my last role, I took on the the worst performing 3PL site for Amazon in Europe, and within a year had it at best equal um, across the whole range of metrics. Yeah, so I'm very proud of that. Um, prior to that, in my role, my role prior to that was AGM for Parcel Force for the Midlands. Uh, and my biggest achievement there was um, in the space of five years, I increased sales by 68% from 19 million to 32 million pounds per year, wow. whilst maintaining a 30% contribution rate. And I achieved that using my operational management control skills. I mean, that's, um, that's really amazing. How do you do that? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's hard. Well, it's not hard. It's just, it's just about going in and realising and seeing what needs to be done. Um, having a vision, um, selling that vision to everybody. And I don't mean just the, your direct reports. You have to sell your vision to every single person that works for you. Um, going there and taking them on a journey. Um, taking people with you unfortunately you have to identify as well that some people can't some people don't want to do it some people can't do it and you have to help these people as well Um, I mean when I took the when I took over the the AGM role um, my first job I was given was to get rid of the area sales manager why you know but we think he's useless well hang on a minute the guy before me was wasn't the best in the world so maybe the guy just needs a or the person, sorry, just needs a, um, a bit more guidance. Um, took him, took the person under my wing, um, coached them, gave them the wealth of my experience in dealing with people and how to deal with their DRs, um, and took an underperforming sales team to one which won national awards uh, in the company um, for, for the sales team, and also two individuals who won individual salesperson of the year awards as well. But it's about about going out and getting these people to believe in you and to believe in the vision and also at the same time you investing lots of time in them and making them know that they can trust you as well. 
That's absolutely brilliant. It's really interesting you say that because that's something that I say socialised mavericks do as a matter of course, that they're able to take a corporate vision and really bring it on to, um, bring it to a, an understanding for other people to move forward with. And mm. in terms of what they do is that they allow people to borrow their reputation as a company to borrow their reputation. Because what you said there, you know, people believed in you, so then they could follow you. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. Would you see yourself as a socialised fabric? Um, I don't know what a socialised fabric is. I'm me, you know. I'm I'm just me, you know. I'm I'm people people try and say and pigeonhole you and say, oh, you're this and you're that, you know. Well, fine. If I am, I am, you know. I'm, um, I I haven't gone out my way to be that. I, I do what's right mm. and what I believe is right. Yeah. I stand up for the little man. Um, mm. if that um, I bend not bend the rules, but I, I'll manipulate the rules and keep within the rules to set, most of the time to achieve what I want. If that makes me a social maverick, then yeah, I'm a social maverick. Yeah, I think you you are definitely a socialised maverick. How do you how do you sell the vision? I'd be very curious to see how you do it. Mm -hmm. How do I sell the vision? Mm. I take the vision and I, I do, be it my own personal vision or the company vision. I'll take the company vision and I'll put my own spin on it. I'll make sure I'll, I'll find out what that vision means to the, each individual people. For years ago, if I go by a very simple one um, from years ago. Uh, when I worked in the brewing industry, we all had teams to uh, brief in the morning. And we were all given the same brief. You know, so once, once a week we had to do team briefs. And we were given two sheets of paper and it had all the blurbs that coming down from, from the top. Um, so you were given, you're given the sheets of paper about half an hour before the brief. You had to go through it, read them and say, oh, okay, this is happening, that's happening. What I used to do is I used to take things out of it and put, put, the, put the spin on it so that the drivers and the warehouse staff, actually, it meant something to them. You know, and said, oh, well, for example, we're going to standard, you know, we're moving to such and such, or we're moving away from this size of can. You know, you can go in and see all the people and say, hey, guys, guess what? You know, we're having problems building all these, these pallets up. It's going to stop now because we're standardising can sizes. And you go, oh, wow, oh, I didn't know that. You know, and that was... You, you, you take things out and you, you, you put this, not a spin, but you make it live for the people that you're speaking to. And you make them want to do, to do something. You make it live for them and also so they can actually know what they have to do to help you. Hmm. I like that, making it live for them. And I think hmm. that's, that's one of the things that a lot of managers really are unable to do isn't it because they don't think about translating it into language that people understand no they don't i mean i'm not a big fan of the word manager to be honest jude mm, no. um i think it go, it's it's an outdated term it's autocratic or well, it lends itself to being autocratic mm. and boss and you know i hate people call me boss <laughs> you know i, I, I hate if someone walks up and says hey boss it's a, i'm not a boss you know my name's alec <laughs> you know or they come up and say mr stables it's a look it's not Mr. Stables, it's not boss. My name's Alec. The same way as your name's Jim or Sheila or, or Pete or Jane, you know? I've got a name. Treat me as a person, you know? You know, I may have a, I may have a, a different job, but we still got the same goals, you know? Yeah. And that's the, way I, that's the way I look at it. You know, I think managers are, the word manager's outdated. Your manager should be not in a hierarchy. He should be in, in, in the middle of the cell, you know, like living in the cell. Mm. Like if oh, I don't know if you think think of something like an amoeba. First thing it's came to my head, you've got this little dot in the middle. It's a it's a it's a basic setup, you know, and it just goes around. You know, the manager should be in the middle of the cell, just floating around inside it, making sure that this part of it's working and that part of it's working, and this bit knows what it's doing. And if this bit's in trouble, he brings the help from the other bit of the cell over to help it. You know. That Sorry, makes, I'm running on. No, no, that makes perfect sense because. I think a manager manages tasks. You know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be man. You don't manage people. You lead people. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think yeah. socialized mavericks. What they do is that they empower other leaders. They make sure that everybody they work with are leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, it's for me to having to tell someone what to do as on a constant basis is just silly it's a waste of time and it's no good for the individual 
Well, it's not good for individual. You know, it doesn't help them at all. So they're coming back saying, what do you want me to know, sir? What do you want me to know? You know, people need, if they want to develop, they need to be able to think for themselves and react to situations that are happening. If you don't do that, then you're never going to be a leader yourself, are you? If you keep running back and asking questions. I mean, I've been through, gosh, um, I've had some real highs in my career today. I've had some real lows as well. Mm. You know, but you you learn from the from the lows, and you never ever go back there. You know, it's like trusting people too much. Um, you know, without having checks and balances in place at times. Um, it's it's like um, I remember I had a strike at one of the most important times of year of the sales year. Um, gosh, when I was a very young manager, when I thought I was. Jack the lad and I did everything and everybody danced to my tune, you know, and you counted how many people you sacked because it was like a trophy, you know. Oh, wow. So, and you look back and you think, God, how stupid and ignorant I was by then. <laughs> you know, how on earth did I survive? And how? But, you know, I did it because I, I realised and I had a very good mentor, um, one of the, the supervisors at work who, who unfortunately passed away many years ago. He kind of took me under his wing, and he was a wise old owl. He taught me loads of things um, and, and how to deal with people. Um, a chap called Tom Connors, and I'll never forget him. Um, and he helped me develop, and he helped me, and he showed me what told me, showed me, told me, told me how to deal with situations and people. And I just developed on from that, you know, a little bit of tuition from him. Mm. And um, I'm nowhere near like the person I was before. And when I said I made lows, I mean, I had a strike. I would never have another strike again in my life, believe me. It's the worst <laughs> thing in the world. It was a different time then, I guess. It was, it was. I worked in a um, clothes shop um, where the, the union ruled. And um, and uh, we had a decided disagreement with the convener over who ran the depot. Unfortunately, he won on that day. <laughs> But four months later, there was nothing better than being able to stand in front of 120 drivers and take away the staff from them and see. And you could lose, and, and you'd won. So, yeah, you always get back and win. Anyway, that's um, going off. Of course, there. Uh, apologies. No, no, that's not. That's, 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 totally, that's totally interesting because not many people will remember a time where uh, unions was as strong as that in the UK. Um, but the art of negotiation with the unions that you would have picked up then has probably stood you in good stead now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can't. I mean, I, I interview people, and I have been interviewed by people who've never worked with the unions. Mm. And I, I, I speak to people, and they say, oh, "I hate unions. Unions are this. Unions are that." You know, and you think, "Well, hang on. Yeah, yeah, they can be if you let them get to that stage." You know, I mean, I'm a I went for an interview last week and I probably the thing that probably um, ruined it for me was the, the chap who was interviewing me said he hated unions and he couldn't understand why they had them. And I said, well, hang on a minute. I said, um, I'm a very big believer in you get the union that you deserve. Yes. You know, if you treat people terribly, you will get a bad union. If you treat people good, then you don't need a union. You know, I've kept unions out of places where I worked before and one of the companies I worked before. Um, it was a national distribution centre. Um, it was only about 70, 100 people worked there. And the, the union were trying to come in the door. And it was about £5 a month. And I remember sitting in the canteen one day on a cup of tea with some of the um, barroom lawyers and the, the voices and the people who, you know, the movers and shakers in the workforce that influenced everyone else. And they said, yeah, we're thinking about joining the union. I went, why? So look after us. I went, all right, okay. When was the last time anybody got sacked in here? Uh, well, blah, blah, got sacked. He said, yeah, because he smashed a bit of PPE up, didn't he? Um, PPT. PPT up deliberately. Well, yeah. He said, you try to tell me he shouldn't have been sacked for that. No, he should have been. I went, all right, okay. Who's, who gives you all the free coffee for your canteen? Well, you do. I said, who, um, when the night shift's working on late because they're busy, who goes out and buys 20, breakf 20 breakfast baps 
for the guys to make sure they have a breakfast before they go home. Well, you do. Well, okay. So when we're busy on the days and the day shift have to stay on to help with the back shift a little bit, who goes out and buys 25, 30 fresh suppers and comes in and feeds everybody? Well, you do. Oh, okay. And who keeps your canteen all um, nice and tidy and clean? Well, you guys do. And do you get treated badly? Well, no, we don't. So what do you think about joining the union for? You know what? You're right. I said, yeah, I know I'm right. Stick the five a month into your ABCs. You know? <laughs> Stick the five pound into your ABCs. Who needs a union? You've got people that treat you properly. You know, you guys work hard for me and I look after you. Yeah, you're right, you do. You do, Al. I said, yeah, I know I do. So on, no, no more of the stupid talk about unions and having votes for unions. You know, and, and that was a site the union were desperate to get into and, and I kept aware of it through yeah. looking after your staff and, and being good to your staff. What you said is that you've kept them out, not by threats or mm. bad talking them, but just by being a good leader. They realised yeah. there was no need for that. No, there's not. And I've, I've seen, um, but on the, on the flip side, I go back to when I think I lost this, this job interview last week when I disagreed with the, the, the person who was interviewing me. And I said, look, I'll sit on the fence here because I, I, t- I see what you mean about it can get very, um, depends on the local union rep. But I've seen some horrendous cases of mismanagement. Mm. Um, you know, not physical or mental abuse, but I've seen some real abuse in the workforce where people don't have unions to, to back them up. The unions can be a good thing, they can be a bad thing. I've worked with unions all my career. Generally speaking, I don't have a problem with them. They don't have a problem with me. When I left, um, I used to work with the CWU. Um, when I worked with, worked with the parcel force, some would say as militant as they come. Um, but when I went into this operation, um, I went against the grain and I, I worked with the union after about five years of people trying to work against them and beat them into submission. And guess what? I worked with the union within... Six months, we turned that operation around. We stopped failures. We wrote a brand new blueprint agreement together in 2008, which is still in place now. Um, we gave the company a stable, um, pardon the pun, a stable base for, in order for it to expand, which it couldn't do because it kept failing work all the time. Um, it was only through working with the union and being that progressive that we allowed the company to expand and make even more money. Had the union, had we not done that, that wouldn't have happened, you know? And um, when I left, I had to stop the, I had to stop the union having a car park meeting, complaining that I was leaving. And the, and the, <laughs> head, of the, yeah, and the head of the CWU was saying to my MD at the time, don't let them go, it's been the best IR and, and you know, the, the hubs have never worked as well for the past X amount of years, what are you letting them go for? Yeah. Wow. The thing is, it's, it's interesting because I think unions just want what good leaders want. You know, fairness for, for the people that are doing the job, good working conditions. You know, mm-hmm. it's not as if they're looking for something that's bad for the company or their employees. So I think, you know, I mm-hmm. think your adage about you get the unions that the management deserves is totally, totally correct. It is. I've always believed that, Jude. I will always believe that. Um, Unfortunately, when I go out there and I see people who interview me um, or I interview or I just generally meet, um, as soon as you come up with that expression, you know, people, you know, people who think the old way to switch off on the spot, you know, and and that, 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 that annoys me. It makes me sad, actually, because, you know, it's it takes you back to where we were years ago. And if we don't watch, we're going to end up doing that. Because, yeah. um, and that's not that's not good enough for anybody or anybody at all. No, that's true. I was interested in you, when you was telling me about how you turned that poor performing salesman round through your coaching, did you... Those team. Yeah, did, did you use any particular method or was it just, what did you do? Um, I had a very frank chat with the area sales manager on week one um, and told him what I was instructed to do and said, but I'm not going to do that because I don't think you've been given the chance. 
are you going to work with me? Um, I kept him by my side for a good month or so, initially, so they could see what he was doing, you know, giving him nudges to, I don't think, I don't, you know, just giving him the wealth of my knowledge and experience to say, I don't think that's right, I don't think this is right. Or, well, hey, fantastic, love the way you did that, hey, love the way you did that, mate, that was out of this world. Um, when we're going to give presentations or ask to give presentations, um, I would help him with his presentation. Um, every month we had to do, um, month, well, not we had to we had to give a breakdown of the accounts and what was happening in the area each on a monthly basis. I developed a new set of slides and a new way of presenting what I thought the the M, the, the MD would be looking for. So look, this is what you need. This is what you want. Or what I would want. Um, change the slide pack round to 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 represent that made sure that um, we acted in a very professional way. And in doing that, changed his, the, the perception of him within the company. But yes, I would go out, I would go out with, um, out and work with them. I would go and work with all my salespeople. I had six, gosh, six new business execs, um, four, um, four tele salespeople, and four contract managers in the sales team, as well as an area sales manager. But I knew I would go and work with every single one of them. Yeah, I would, I would go out on a daily basis. I would, I would, because um, I had a big area. I went from Grimsby down to um, almost Peterborough, taking in Leicestershire, Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, Northamptonshire, the whole of the West Midlands, Leicestershire, Wales, up to Wrexham, down to Hereford, Aberystwyth, um, Aberdovey on the left, on the Welsh coast. So I would make a point of driving to any part of that in the morning so I could meet one of my salespeople out on the road. So I would drive for about an hour, hour and a half, meet one of my salespeople at nine o'clock, do a complete day's work with them, go back, pick my car up and drive home. Um, and I got to know people and they got to know me. Mm. And I got to know what they needed. And I got to get it firsthand from them. And I could go back to them and give them what they needed to do as well. And get them to believe in me. Say, oh well, we, you know, we can't do this. The depots won't allow us to do that. So, oh, hang on, what do you mean the depots won't allow us to do that? Um, no, we can't do it because one of the one of the issues when I went into the area was it's very siloed. You know, you had an operations silo, you had a sales silo, and you had something that was meant to be a customer service person with a couple of people working for them, which was just didn't exist. So, it was breaking those silos down and building people up. And making sure that everybody um, had an input. And when I went there, um, you'd have people would say, oh, we can't get any sales when we can't get any work in because of the, the depot won't let us do it. And the depot saying, yeah, look at us, we're great. You know, yeah, I'm running a really tight ship here. Look at me. We're not, we're not interested in sales. And after a couple of years of having people together, working together, and creating that little bit of competitiveness, you know, when I were in a team meeting one day, and one of the sales salespeople turned around and said, "I've just signed a two hundred thousand pound account." Wow! And I went, "Yeah, fantastic!" And one of the other, um, one of the operations managers in charge of the depot said, "Why can't I get a two hundred thousand pound account?" I said, "Well, are you working with your guys to try and get them, but well, you meant to be." Yeah, but we can't do it. You know, and that was the day that they all realized that they all had to work together right. and then they were, out, they were out doing oh what space have we got on this route what space have we got on that route? if we change this round, can we do that and it took, it took yeah up to two years but it, it took um in doing that and the whole team meshed together mm. um ops customer service sales they didn't look at themselves as we're a sales team we're the ops team they looked on themselves as we're the Midlands team and we're the best. Yeah, you know? yeah. And they went from the sales sales went went from the almost the worst amount of revenue being brought into top amount of revenue in the company. Um, and wow. it was the best delivery area and cheapest. Uh, but you know, it was it was it wasn't a bad area before I took over. Sales were terrible. Operationally, it was fairly good. When I left, it was the best all round. Mm. And that's the thing about breaking down silos and stuff. I'm really interested in the fact that 
you've managed or led multiple sites because mm-hmm. that has to be a lot harder than actually being co-located on one site um there's a couple of little different things you've got to do mm-hmm. you know it's um it means you've got to drive for a couple of hours in the morning to get to see some of your people um but it takes a little bit longer to get to know them mm-hmm. But you get to the point where, you know, and it should be, you know, single site or, or multi-site. When I go to a site in the morning, I don't go to the office. I walk through the warehouse. Mm. And I know the people now I walk through the warehouse saying, hi, oh, John, how you doing? Oh, hi, Katie. You know, hey, see, your team got beaten last night. You know, and I can walk through the warehouse and speak to the people and then go and speak to the, the FLNs. And then go into the office and then then speak to the, the depot manager if he's not on the floor at the time. You know, it's about being available for everybody. So yeah, so it's 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 harder because you've got four or five different locations, but it's just it's the same principles. Uh-huh. It's the same principle. I understand it's been the same principle, but why do people struggle so hard? I mean I've you know, when I used to do HR, there were people like you that didn't really do it. But there were many more people who just could not. They have a favourite site, for example, and that site would do really well. But they couldn't really manage the whole entirety of it. Makes it it's easy. It's easy to concentrate on one and have. If you got if you got a few, Jude, it's easy to concentrate on one, have one good one, and one have a nice base where you can feel safe and secure. And I would have thought. Um, trouble is you've got other sites that need to be looked after as well. Um, I rather wouldn't have one site I can feel safe and secure in. I'd rather have six or seven I can feel safe and secure in, you know, and it just takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of foresight. You know, you allocate your time. You don't become lazy. You know, you don't sit on one site and become lazy. You know, you keep on you keep on the go all the time. You make a point you've got to do it. You know, it's okay, you got to go in and see someone on night shift in, in Nottingham. Oh, God, I've got to go to Lincoln and see someone on nights and I live in Birmingham. Oh, right, well, hey, no big deal. So what? You know, people deserve to see, you know, I'll, I'll use a phrase, I don't like it, but they deserve to see the boss. Mm. Does, doesn't matter what shift they work. Doesn't matter where they work. They deserve the chance to speak and be seen and have a chat and interrogate if you want for want of a better word the boss you know and um i do that i i do that i, I think it's a fundamental right it's not their fault it's not it's not jimmy's fault he works on night shift in lincoln and the boss lives in birmingham and he's never going to see him again in his life you know that's not right you know yeah. if there's briefings to be done you know why are we going to do it you can't afford to sit back and treat one differently because i think that's just laziness it might well is it laziness? They might not have the toolkit to do it. They might not want to do it. Um, they might just not be unaware how to do it. You know, maybe they've not had to do it. I've been, I've, I've run single sites from, gosh, uh, before I moved down to England. I was a warehouse manager for Scotland up in Tennant, Caledonia, and I looked after two, two sites, one in Air and one in Dumfries. So I started running the warehouse and run an out, um, an out site, uh, an out base in Dumfries and an out base in. Um, air and also look after the trunking in between them as well. Mm. Um, the loads, 17 loads a day that were going between them um, overnight. So I've always had to do it. Um, I enjoy it. You know, I, I do. I, I do love that kind of work. Is it because um, it's it's more varied? Yeah, I'm going to say that. Is it because it's it's different each time because each site has its unique culture? Hmm. Yeah, they've got the yeah yeah you have each, each site's got its management team and its its team that runs it and and the people involved and they're different, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you go if you go to somewhere like Shrewsbury, um, or over in Shropshire, almost Welsh, uh, right on the Welsh border, that's a totally different operation to Lincoln, which is on the the other side of the country, now in the Fens. You got Lincolnshire, and that's totally different to Birmingham, which is you know probably second biggest city in in, in, in England, massive um, multicultural. Um, you go to you go to Shrewsbury, you know the, the um, there'll be no cultural mix there. 
you go to Lincoln, there'll be no cultural mix there. Birmingham, I, said, I think you've got every 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 race under the sun works for you, you know. Mm. Um, the same in Coventry, you know, every race, every every country from Europe is represented in your workforce, and every country from the Caribbean as well, and Africa. Um, and that's what makes them all so different. And Leicester, it's a fantastic place, you know. There's, there's um, a Nottingham, um, a lot of Scotsmen in Nottingham as well, which isn't a bad thing. But, um, you know, the, the, the cultural diversity of, you know, across these places is it's phenomenal as well, you know. So would you, um, would you say that's important for a leader through the, throughout their career to have worked in places that are very diverse, not just in the culture and the, the people that make up it, but the types of work and the industries? Do you think it makes you more... Because there's this thing, isn't it, where some people prefer to stick in one industry and only do that one industry, whereas there's others like me who prefer to go into lots of different industries. So you, do you think it's better to do that or does it just depend on the individual? I think it doesn't... I, I think. Um, the more different industries you can work in, then the better the um, experiences you'll have and the more rounded you'll become. I don't think because you haven't worked in industry A that you can't work in industry A. I think the principles that you bring with, bring as a leader, the principles that you bring with you and the principles that you hold mean that you'll be able to, to work in no matter where you go. I mean, I've worked in the removals industry. I've worked in the beer industry. I've worked in white goods. I've worked in tires. Got even delivered people, um, parcels, um, and and warehouse operations for picking and packing for companies like Amazon. Um, I've worked over a you know quite a vast array of different fields. Um, does that make me a better manager? I think at the end of the day, it does. Mm. And do people stay in, what happens to people if they stay in one one area all the time? I think that, I think they'll get I'm surprised they don't get bored out of school to be honest. Yeah. Um, they'll become very experienced in what they're doing, but they won't be able to do anything else. Um and I, to be honest, I don't think the fact that you haven't worked in industry A before means that you can't. I think because you worked in industry B, C, D, E, and F means that you should work in A and people in industry A should be looking for you because Hang on a minute. You know we've been we've been doing this for years now. We could do with some fresh ideas and some fresh blood, um, and that's what I've found when I've gone into different places. I've taken the experience the experiences from working in previous situations and applied and adapted them to the the new industry I was working in. Now you'd never get that if you only worked in a certain type of industry all the time, would you? No, exactly. So, yeah. you know, so I think you need to, and people need to move from industry to industry because there's good things and bad things in each one. Um, and the more cross fertilization, for want of a better word, um, is, 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 it can only be a good thing. I know. I remember working in an area where they had to schedule 30 people Monday to Friday, and they were saying that. You know, it's never been done before. It's not something that's an industry standard. It's impossible to do. And I remember saying, how does a supermarket schedule a 1,000 people 24-7? Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, yeah, I see your point. But because in in their bubble, they'd never seen it before, that they were very yeah. resistant to the need to schedule people. And when you think about it, 30 people Monday to Friday, it's not a lot of scheduling, really. No, it's not. I know it's not. But, I mean, but if you... That, 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 that just makes my, you know, it backs my point up. Yeah. Um, if you're going to get people working in the same place all the time, you're never going to get any, no one's going to challenge, challenge you, are they? No one's going to go against the, go against the, 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 the norm. And that's what needs to happen, you know, and, you know, rules are there, but I mean, hey, you know, you've got to be able to change these rules or, or amend these rules to, 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 to move on. That makes perfect sense. So if you had a, supposing there you are working in your multi-site area and you've got a fresh out of university graduate who you are asked to mentor in so that one day they'll end up doing what you're doing, what what kind of things would you ask them or set for them to do so that they could be a really efficient and good leader on a multi-site? 
on a multi-site. Yeah. Um, if I was given a graduate for six months, I'd go and I'd, um, I'd give them for a week at a time to each per, each site manager, and I'd say go out and and find out how these people do things. No point hanging around my tailcoat all my tailcoat all the time. Um, you go out, you meet meet these people on a daily basis, spend a week with each one. Find out what makes them tick. Find out what makes their depots tick and get under the skin of them. Learn the business that you're doing. This is a business you're going to work in. Learn it. You know, if it means you jump in the back of a van and go and deliver some parcels, hey, mm. you jump in the back of a van and go and deliver some parcels. I've done it. I've done it loads of times. I've jumped in the back of trailers and tipped trailers when it's busy. You know, um, it needs to be done. If it needs to be done, it needs to be done. It doesn't matter what job you're meant to be doing. If you've got a suit on and something's happening, you know, or someone doesn't turn in, you say, chuck it in my car and I'll go out and do it. So um, you learn the role, you learn the job from the bottom up, and then you, you then are able to then speak to people about the about what it is you're doing. Yeah, if you don't if, if you don't know if you don't know what you people are doing, how can you manage them or how can you help them better themselves? Mm. You need to know what needs to be done. You need to understand it, and you need to understand it from their point of view so you can speak to people from a knowledge perspective. That way they will help you. So if I was given a graduate, I would send them out, and the first six weeks would be to, or longer, would be to learn that operation in each site. Spend a week, do whatever that needs to. Spend two weeks and do it. You need to be able to um, be knowledgeable about what you're speaking to people about and, and know what should be happening so that you can then move forward and help improve things. Yeah, that's that's a really good tip. I remember um, my first management role was in retail, supermarket retail. One of the things that you really had to do was, if you were a senior manager like I was, you had to understand how every function worked. So you spent time working in each each function. And I found that, that was such a really good setup. So whenever I went somewhere else, um, I would always do an appreciation in each area, whether mm. it's a physical one or sitting down with the managers and getting them to really explain how things work. And I remember working in one organisation and saying I wanted to do that, and they were so shocked. <laughs> they were like, why would you want to go, like you said, on a van and see this? And it was just because I want to understand, you know, when we recruit someone in this position, I want to understand what it is that they're really doing. Yeah. You know, well, and why, I wouldn't think- you want to, why wouldn't you want to do it though? I mean, um, you know, I, fair play for what for asking to do it, you know, but why wouldn't you want to? Mm. You know, I mean, for if nothing else, you know, um, you know, it makes you meet your people, doesn't it? Yeah, and it makes you have to you have to come back and say that you have to you have to remember that's what it's all about. It's all about people. At the end of the day, mm. you know, companies I work in and the companies I've been working in lately, you know, eighty percent of the budget is people. Yeah. So why on earth would you cast off eighty percent of your budget and not worry about it and not and not care about it and not invest in it? It's ridiculous. It you know. Yeah, yeah, that's the biggest part of biggest part of the industries I work in now. People are the biggest part, you know, and and I've seen companies that say, "Oh yeah, we do this," and 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 you know they don't, you know, and yeah, and, and they, um, I know you don't because another way you treated me over the past two weeks trying to get me in the door. Yeah. Um, so don't try and tell me that you look after people <laughs> because because you because you're absolutely terrible. Um, you know, and, and but that has got to be, you know, and you know. To reiterate what you said about getting to know things, it's all about people, you know. Right. And you want to get in and understand because, you know, like that company that you were talking about when you said, "Oh, I want to go and meet people," and they're like, oh, you don't want to do that, do you? Big bad people, you know. <laughs> if, you, if, if you didn't, then you know, subconsciously they would have kept you away from that. And you yeah, know, I had to fight. For, I had to basically yeah. say. I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you hadn't been your own, if you hadn't been your own person, and, and you hadn't been that, the fact you're adamant you wanted to do it, they would have subconsciously kept you away from that, and and you wouldn't have found out what was going on or potentially what was happening. You know, yeah. so, not fair play, Jude. That's, that's well done. Thank you. I mean, one thing also I learned in that supermarket was really interesting was that the power of your seniority 
shouldn't be taken lightly. So one of the things I went to do, I, went, I always remember this because I was about, I don't know, in my early 20s, I went to, ba- went to the bakery to do my stint in bakery and they gave me the labels to stick on the breads that, you know, had been recently made. And I'm sitting around and I'm sticking all the labels on and they changed the breads, I'm still sticking the labels on. And then eventually, I've been doing this for the whole day, and then eventually somebody said, oh, uh, we, we have to throw away quite a lot of that bread that you've been working on. And I was like, why? And they said, um, because you didn't change the labels over, so now we're not allowed to have these types of breads with these end dates on them or something like that. And I said, oh, can't you just change the dates? And they're like, no, 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 because it's against the law. We just have to bin them. And I said, so I've wasted hundreds of pounds here. And they said, yes, because why didn't you tell me? And they said, mm-hmm. because you're a senior deputy and we're not allowed to tell you when you're wrong. And I was like, seriously? Mm-hmm. And then we like, obviously that all stopped once they got back into the office. But it was shocking that the staff in that particular store would allow me to waste hundreds of pounds because they were mm-hmm. too frightened. Or cause it wasn't me because I've only, you know, only been there like a week. So it was more the position. They were too frightened yes. to say. And that really shocked me and I, that really changed, really informed my leadership going forward, understanding mm. the power of your position and making sure you use it properly. Because even though I was going, am I doing it right? They were like, yeah, yeah, everything's fine. And they're just sitting there looking mm. at they're going to have to throw away that bread at the end of the day. It's just mad. If I tell her she's doing it wrong, she might sack me. Yeah, that was the yeah. culture of that organisation at that time. Yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? Really is. Yeah, you, you can understand. You can understand how the people felt, though, can't you? I mean, yeah, if, if that was the culture, oh, I can't say anything. You know, you know, and that's that's and that's what you know really annoys me when people say, "Hey, boss," you know, but don't call me boss, you know, and don't call me Mister. You know, I've got a name. I'm approachable. I'm a person. I'm a human being like you. Because I mean, in that same organisation, I was told off by the, the like my boss because. I allowed the staff to call me my, by my first name rather than my surname. And it wasn't appropriate of my, at my level of seniority to let the staff call me by my first name. And I was like, well, I'm HR. <laughs> I'm mm. HR. You know, I kind of mm. want people to talk to me. And it was like, I mean, obviously, I helped completely change the culture there. But that was what mm. it was like when I arrived. It was like, you're not supposed to let people talk to you. You're not you're supposed to walk around and have your own seat at the, at the table. And I remember getting told off because I sat with the staff sometimes and didn't sit with the, the managers at lunch all the time. And it was like, I, what year are we in? Well, <laughs> uh, like Grace Brothers. Are you being served in Grace Brothers, isn't it? It was exactly like that. And this you know, was what, early oh, 90s. Yes, yeah, Spoken. this is the 90s. And it's just like, yeah. it's just mad. But um, no, it's... Um, you know, it's good that things change. You know, yeah. Um, and I just, I just hope it doesn't go full circle and goes back again, and that we, we, um, not lose control, but we disrespect each other to the nth degree, mm-hmm. because we don't have unions nowadays that we actually have people out there who, are, who for their own benefit and their own use, will abuse people and abuse staff, and um, get us back into those crazy, crazy situations again, because it's, there's no need for it, Jude. No, we need real leadership. Really. You, do, you do. You know, we, we need we need true leaders out there in business. We need people who can sell visions. We need people that can take workforces with them. We need people who, who are not afraid to think outside the box, who challenge ideas. And I mean, this all sounds, oh, he's read a book somewhere. But it's not. It's what I actually believe in. You know, mm. people should challenge and should say, why do you do that? You know, why do you do it that way? You know, and you know, it, it, it's 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 necessary for moving on and keeping life going in business. You know, it's like when you just to go back to what you said. You know, some people don't change industries. Wow. You know, okay. You know, maybe it's nice. You know, maybe it's nice to sit in the same industry. And once you've learned it after five years, you don't have anything to worry about for the next forty years when you're working. Oh, that sounds terrible. But, um, it really sounds so it, horrible. <laughs> it does, but. You'll never improve. You know, you'll never improve. You need to go out and challenge and take the take the the learnings from one one industry and stick it up and put it into another one and adapt it and make the other one better. Yeah. And if you need to go back to the other one and say, actually, I changed it. This is what happens. You know, but you do need people who are, who are, who are not afraid to challenge um, the status quo. 
Yeah. Um, if you leave the status, if you just have the status quo, you're never going to achieve anything. You're never going to improve. You know, one of my customers used to say to me, if, if when when I took over a contract and it was failing, what are you doing different today? You failed yesterday. What are you doing different? Mm. I said, oh, we're doing, we're, we're trying this and we're trying that. See how we can um, sort of improve. And he said, I don't mind if you fail tomorrow because you're trying something different. The worst thing you can do is fail tomorrow and do the same as you did yesterday because that means you're going to fail tomorrow. Mm. And so you've got to be constantly looking at ways of doing things and changing if need be and improving. And, you know, that's one of the fundamental things I think I, I do believe in. Um, challenge and all, treat your people properly. Um, as I say, they're a massive part of your, work, of your expenditure, people. Um, you really do need to look after them. You know, um, and you know what? You might actually make some friends exactly. by getting to know people. You know, it wouldn't be the first time it's happened to me. You know, that you actually become friendly and make make relationships with people um, that you work with or work for you or they think they work for you. You know, it wouldn't be the first time I've um, met similar minded people um, and and had a good friendship out of it. Okay, this is a good place to stop. Um, mm-hmm. Thanks for thanks for that, Alex. Would you come back again on something else? Yeah, of course I would. You know, would you? Anything for you, my friend. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you once again for tuning into the Maverick Paradox podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with Alex as much as I enjoyed having it. If you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the Maverick Paradox then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally, if you'd like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk. (laughs) 